You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 169, Surviving and Thriving in Seminary with Danny Zacharias and Ben Forrest. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Very good. I've been looking forward to this episode. I have been looking forward to this episode as well, and that's because, Mike, we actually got our first sponsor of the show, and it's none other than your employer, with Logos yeah. 7 basic software. Yeah. Can you believe it? I, I'm, I'm excited about, about it. I mean, yeah. yeah, really. I mean, you know, we, uh, we, we've we been talking, you know, sort of inside baseball behind the scenes about uh, sponsors and whatnot. And this is like the perfect one because this is a tool I use every day. And, you know, we care about Bible study here and the audience cares about Bible study good tools. And this is just like the perfect match. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Logos 7 Basic is a great introduction to what Logos 7 could do for you during seminary school. And uh, it's useful during seminary. And actually, there's some benefits of Logos 7 Basic, which is resources, which includes commentary, sermons, dictionaries, mm-hmm. encyclopedias, yep. lexicons, and more. And then there's note-taking benefit, a search benefit, and portability benefit. So can you tell us about the resources benefit with actually including over a dozen books that's valued for over $157? Yeah, they they, they gave us a nice deal, really. I mean, people can go up to uh, logos.com, that's L-O-G-O-S dot com slash Naked Bible, and you can get Logos 7 Basic for free. So if the resources were the only thing in the package, it'd be worth it because, like you said, it's it's over one hundred and fifty dollars uh, worth of books. You get the Lexham English Bible. Um, you know, I I participated in producing that. I did the, uh, the the Genesis portion of that translation. You get a Bible commentary. You get Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, some devotionals, a little bit of church history stuff, Greek and Hebrew lexicons. Can you get all these books for free, for nothing? Again, just by visiting logos.com slash naked Bible. What about the note taking ability with Logos seven basically? Yeah, the, yeah, we, we should talk about that because again, I you know, I work there, I use the software. This is one of the neatest things uh, about it. Uh, there's a lot that separates Logos from you know doing something online or working in PDF. And this is one of the neat resources. You can take notes. Like I, I make notes, you know, for the podcast, for instance, I might be doing that at Starbucks or something or some other location, you know, waiting for the kids or, and whatnot. But if I do it in the software, it will sync across devices no matter where I'm at. So I'll, I, I would close my laptop. I go home. I open up the software at home and there are my notes. I mean, I don't have to put anything on a flash drive. It's just there. It, it syncs in the cloud. So note taking is just awesome. There are lots of notes within the software, again, that, that you can benefit from, but you can put different sort of information into a note. Uh, you can make a note like a document. You can put notes in your resources, like with the right click, you know, just put a little a little tab will open up. You write a note in there and it's all saved. You can highlight things. You can underline. You can put other, you know, sort of highlighting symbols in there, but everything you do uh, in the software, whether creating like a document, you know, just something like a word processor that's built in, but something that, that looks like that or appending notes to resources and books, it, it just all saves like magic in the cloud. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Well, tell us about the search feature. Yeah. Yeah. The, the search searching in software again is, is a much you know bigger deal, not in terms of, of use, but just sort of what goes on under the hood. That it's probably the most powerful the feature of it, it is. Logo 7. It is. You, you get the whole Bible, uh, English you know, translation, obviously Greek and Hebrew. There, they have you know morphological tags uh, in that information. What that means that that's that's sort of fancy software talk for. If I'm in an English Bible, for instance, and I right click on on a word, you can actually search the Greek or Hebrew word that is underneath the English that you never you know, never actually see because you're looking at an English Bible. You can actually run a search. On the primary text language, starting with English, using this software. 
it, 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 it's crazy because you, you would think you'd have to be looking at an interlinear. You'd have to be looking at, you know, Greek or Hebrew text, but you actually don't need to do that uh, with, with Logos 7. It's because of the magic of the reverse interlinear. But you can run Hebrew and Greek searches and, and generate all kinds of reports on those searches using nothing but English. You don't even have to know the alphabet. Awesome. And what I love about it is that you can use it on anything. It's Windows, yep. Mac, and mobile. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. We are platform agnostic. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't matter what, what you have. And again, if you have a handheld device, you're going to be able to look at that uh, notes that you've left. And, and, you know, again, it's just no matter where you are, it's mobile. And so you're not stuck, you know, with just one machine at home or even one, one type of machine. And again, we, you know, we've encountered all this over the years that this is what users want. It's what people, you know, you know, doing research now and just frankly doing anything now they expect, they just expect the mobility cross platform and, and you get it right here. Absolutely. And please go support our show by going to logos.com slash naked Bible and get logo seven basic free. And we really want to thank Faith Life uh, for sponsoring this episode. And it could not come at a better time with the subject matter. I'm excited. That's true. I'm excited about uh, talking to Danny and Ben because they're doing great stuff. Yep, absolutely. Well, it's great to have Danny and Ben on our show to talk about their book, Surviving and Thriving in Seminary. Uh, for our listeners, it might seem like a little bit of a different uh turn. I know most of the audience is not going to be destined for seminary or really even be thinking about seminary, but there's a reason why I wanted to uh, have Danny and Ben on to talk about their book. Uh, th there are parts of it, I think, that are going to be really useful for the audience. But I want to uh, begin by asking you both to introduce yourself. So Danny, why don't we just start with you? Tell the audience a little bit about who you are. Yeah, thanks very much. So my name is Danny Zacharias, and I'm the assistant professor of New Testament at Acadia Divinity College in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. And I've been here for, um, this is my, I think, 10th year teaching. I did two degrees here first and then started working part-time, and now I'm full-time and into the assistant professor role. So, And I have uh, four kids and a cat. <laughs> what, what do you teach? Yeah, so I teach all of the New Testament electives as well as the upper elective Greek courses. Okay, good. Ben, your turn. I am in Lynchburg, Virginia. I grew up in Idaho, came out here for seminary. Um, didn't really know why I came to seminary. I just knew the Lord had called me here. So I, I got a degree and asked him what next. And he said, get another one. And I said, okay, I got another one. What next? And he said, get a doctorate. So I did the, <laughs> the doctorate in education. Um, and right as I was finishing up my degree, the seminary hired me on as faculty, kind of like Danny. And so it was a huge blessing. I came on and taught there for about five years. And then in the past few months have changed roles here in the, in the University at Liberty. Um, and now I'm uh, associate dean in a different department, but really my heart is in seminary and biblical training and education. And so it's been a great journey. The Lord has been a, just very good. Yeah, there, there's a lot going on up there because um, I, the, the audience knows that I, at least some of the audience knows that I'm an online adjunct for Liberty, and it seems like every week there's a new update of something else going on. <laughs> so you, you landed somewhere. I imagine they gave you an office. You know, they're tearing buildings down. Yeah, the very, I did get an office. Not everybody was so lucky <laughs> these days. <laughs> wow. Okay. With that little bit of a self introduction, um, I guess I should say a little bit about uh, why. This caught my attention. Um, people ask me about seminary a lot, and a lot of people who listen to the podcast, I'll get emails and they'll say, "Hey, I'm I'm thinking about taking a class. I'm thinking about going into you know the ministry, or I'm I'm wondering about a de degree program." So I actually get this question more often than you would think, and so that was one of the reasons. But most of the audience, of course, isn't in that camp, and I think uh, your book. Uh, surviving and Thriving in Seminary. This is Lexham Press, Lexham Press title, uh, really provides some good advice on doing research. So I want to focus on having a discussion about how to really just do good research in, in terms of tools, maybe some methods, some advice. And we'll, we'll add a little bit at the end toward those who are thinking about formal education. But for the most part, I think to get the, uh, the most value out of this book, uh, for our audience, I want to focus on just good techniques and good resources, uh, you know, kind of, you know, help 
help guide the audience into just thinking better about what most of this audience wants to do, and that is to learn scripture and really get beyond the surface level sort of content uh, that you might get, you know, in, in, in church or some other sort of neutral setting. So I think to start off, the, the first thing I'd like to ask is just generally, what can a what can a formal education do for a person you know who really wants to study it? And I, that might mean taking an actual class, you know, enrolling, paying tuition and whatnot. But even if someone sits in on a class and audits it, why is that a good thing versus sort of working on your own? So let, let's just start with a real general kind of you know question like that. Why do we need instruction, you know, from professors? Yeah, I'll start with that, Ben, if you don't mind, then mm-hmm. you can jump in after. Yeah. I would say the first thing for people is to recognize that there really is not, there is no such thing as studying on your own in the sense that you're always going to be learning at least from one person. And so, you know, even if you take a video class or you read a book and that becomes your teacher, you are in conversation with someone already. So there, there really is no such thing as it were as solo learning. And when it comes to coming into a class, either a college or seminary level or an online class, you know, if you're doing one with Mike or someone else, it's really about engaging more voices in the conversation. And so it it increases kind of the communal aspect of the learning process. And so that's one of the things that I like uh, and continue to like about being a seminary prof is that um, you get these uh, great voices from different coming from different aspects. And that that includes the students, you know, so I, I just think about my last semester where it was an online course and I had a student who was from Thailand and he's a missionary there and he was, you know, bringing to light questions and thoughts that I would have never thought of and I was the professor. So the fact that we had someone like that in class just really increased um, the richness of our conversation as we were discussing the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's good. I would add to that. It brings accountability. You know, we've all started and stopped something, you know, set our mind or our heart on some new plan or schedule in our life. And at some point, something happens, you know, life happens. Uh, And so I think having the formalized education, either paying for tuition or even committing yourself to a schedule of auditing a class, it really gives you that accountability and makes you show up and then makes you listen, makes you engage. And I think that's a benefit. Yeah, last, uh, I'm trying to think of when it was. I don't think it was this past February, but the one before. I, I taught a uh, an interterm course at Knox Seminary. And it was, you know, I went to Florida. I was there for a week and taught this course. But there were two auditors in the class that actually turned out to be the best students. <laughs> uh, they weren't even, you know, doing the like assignments for credit necessarily or they I think the one you know might have might have switched over for I, I can't remember what the cir- what the circumstance was, but there were again they, the accountability thing I think is important because they had you know you got to show up you know if if you're in sort of a little community like that people know know you they know when you don't show up when you do so that even that small thing that just showing up for class and really you know kind of engaging and and honestly I think if the pressure's off you to be trying to write down every word because, oh, there might be an exam or I might have to use this you know, for a paper or something like that. Uh, in many cases, just sitting in the class and, and kind of you know, going with it, it actually frees up your mind to really think about the material in different ways. You know, you're not trying to just capture it. <laughs> you're actually sitting there thinking about letting your mind drift a little bit. Uh, so th- I think the auditing experience uh, can be really uh, fruitful, beneficial. I mean, I've actually seen that happens. So again, for anybody out in the, uh, in the audience, you know, auditing is just when you, you register for a course, you probably get a re- reduced re- uh, tuition rate. You don't have to do any of the work. You just go in and take advantage of the course. So I, I, I would certainly recommend that. I, I'm going to throw out a few kind of random questions. There's no particular order to these. Um, so I just want to want to get your impression uh, on them. So beyond, again, just being there and Again, I, I agree with Danny that there really is no such thing as totally uh, independent learning because you might be reading a scholar and you know he, he's instructing you, even though there, it's a, it's a you know non embodied presence, if you will. Uh, it, it's not total isolation, so I, I get that. And most of this audience, that's what they're going to be kind of engaged in. They might be part of a small group, they might be you know in a Bible study or whatever. But I have found in this audience, naked, the Naked Bible audience, people really try to do a lot of study. 
and again, they try to get into resources. So I want to spend a good bit of time talking about sources. Can you explain for the audience what the difference between a primary and a secondary source is and why it matters? Yeah, I'll uh, again, I can uh, grab on then, Ben. You can say them after if you want to. But the really the primary source is this is the material that I'm really trying to learn more about. So in the case of your audience and and for uh, many of us, for, for me as a New Testament scholar, it's the New Testament or it's the scripture or perhaps it's you know one of the second temple literature like Enoch or the Dead Sea Scrolls, something like that. And anything else that you bring into conversation then is a secondary source. You know, as you're reading Reversing Hermon or something, that's a secondary source that's supposed to be shedding light, hopefully, on the primary source. And the reason that it is important is because sometimes uh, I find – as a seminary professor, there are times when students, unfortunately, start to get so nervous about interacting with the primary text that they focus too much on the secondary sources. And really, we want the primary source to be the one that we're really trying to understand. And so in insofar as a secondary source is helping you understand the primary source, that's when you come into conversation with that. But if you're not ever engaging with that primary source, then really what you're doing is, you know, just a literature review of other people. And that's that's uh, for the most part, not not what we're trying to do. You know, the, I would compare that to, you know, boy, I hate to say it this way, but we've all we've all heard enough sermons to know the difference, I hope, between someone who really gives us the text. In other words, really, really explains the text. In other, in other words, after it's all over, you can you can retrace your thinking and his thinking to the primary source. You you can you can go back to the primary source and see where that point of thought generated from. We've we've all had the experience of of hearing that you know someone again who who gives us the text as opposed to someone who just spends a lot of time talking about the text. Mm-hmm. You know, you there. There's a big difference between talking about a subject and really taking uh, a student or even someone listening in a conversation into the subject. And yeah, I, I think agree. that that's. I agree. That, yeah, I. You know, I, again, I, I don't want to. You know, we we try not to caricature preaching, you know, too much here, but I think that's a. It is a good analogy. You know, on any given Sunday morning. You know, there's all too it's all too common of an experience to have someone talk about the Bible rather than really teach the text. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and it, it's a significant difference. And you know, when it comes to what we're trying to do, again, again for our audience, Naked Bible here, we we really try to make we want to we want to make scholarship accessible. But the goal is is not to learn the scholarship. The goal is to be taken into the text and see what the text has to say and what it can sustain. Um, next question. Again, and your book, you know, handles. I'm, I'm, I pulled all of these from from a reading of your book, just to get us into the subject matter. You do discuss primary and secondary sources in the book in a helpful way. Uh, what is peer review? You you get into this as well in, in the book. Uh, what is it, and how does it work? And if you can, you give us a little bit of a an example of from your own uh, academic career and, and how this worked, uh, trying to get something published. Ben, you want to take that? Sure. Um... When we've taught students, all three of us have taught students at different times, we've all had a student who is young in their academic career, and they have cited their best friend or their their favorite. um, Church bulletin here, buddy. (laughs) And I'll tell you what, I did that. I took my first year of seminary. I um, I finished college, and I, I was an elementary education major in college. And I got done, and I realized... Lord, I don't want to teach little kids. What can I do? And so that's how the start of seminary called, or start of seminary began in my life. Um, but in that final year of college, I was mentored by a guy who was just brilliant. He had a PhD in chemistry, and he really just encouraged me and poured into my life. And so I, I went to seminary, and I had a, a paper, and I got to choose the topic of the paper. And I'm thinking back on my life about this this guy who had had such a good impact on me, and a lot of what he was taught teaching on was life in the spirit. And so I spent all of my bibliography on this chemistry professor. (laughs) He was a great guy. He loved the Lord, you know, and I just remember getting the paperback and just on page one, my um, professor just said, who is this? And I'm like, well, he's my mentor. 
<laughs> and, and just realizing that there, there was a conversation that was going on about life and the spirit that I hadn't engaged in. And that was kind of my first realization that there's, there's something bigger going on than just individual ideas on a topic. You know, there's a, a bigger conversation that's happened throughout history. And so, you know, going back to primary sources, you, you know, I don't think I spent a lot of time in, in Galatians on that paper, which is problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so you need to spend time in that primary source, but then you also need to spend time um, in sources that have been vetted by those who know. Um, and so it's that kind of start to answer the question. Danny, you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I would just say, like, I, I could give an example, too. So, you know, peer review is is the field, whatever field you're, you know, writing in. It's people in that field who are seasoned scholars saying this, what you just presented in written form is worthy to enter into the wider dialogue yeah. uh, and be subject to what others think from that point. And so, you know, for example, uh, my first article that I published, I submitted it. Uh, I went for the cream of the crop, Mike, and and got rejected from journal for the study of the New Testament. I came back uh, feeling dejected, of course, <laughs> and uh, working through it some more on, on some of what they said. You know, so it's it's also a back and forth process. Yeah, where the the editors uh, came and said, you know, there's this part, this part, this part. I went, I looked at it, I reworked it, and then I submitted it to another journal, and they again they put it out to their editors. And this time it came back and they said, yes, this is good. Actually, I shouldn't say that. One still said no, but the other <laughs> one said yes, and the editor said yes. So the editor was the tiebreaker, and right. so it got published, right? So so you just think of how much better that article was because I went through that process, as opposed to just throwing it out there, whatever, in some sort of different form. Uh, I had the benefit of bouncing it off scholars who knew uh, know mm-hmm. the field uh, as well as I do and better. Yeah, so it's important, again, for those of us who are members of the audience, I mean, when you're trying to do research on a topic, it actually does matter if you're using peer-reviewed sources. The, the, the point is not that a resource that's not peer-reviewed never has anything good to say. That That isn't the point. It, 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 may. it may. It may have a really important insight in there. But Rather, that the point is that the stuff that does get peer reviewed has sort of passed through not a not a filter to winnow out material that the editors just don't like or agree with, or the academy you know does they're not going to agree with this, so they're not going to publish it. Journals publish things that their editorial team, that the people they ask to read, uh, disagree with frequently. the The issue is, does this contribute something meaningful to the discussion? Uh, because the people who are doing this know that, well, this is a controversial subject. Some are going to like this. Some of them are not going to like it. But it's an important thing to think about for both sides, agree or disagree. And, and having gone through that process, the, the, the field experts know that, again, this is something that really is important for anyone interested in the topic to read. Uh, and and, and we're, we're saying that the research is good. Uh, the thinking here, again, agree or disagree, is is worth taking note of, and so yes, this deserves a hearing. Yeah. If you don't go through that process, a, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say it almost comes down a little bit to a time management thing too. I know, yes. Mike, reading, reading, or listening to your podcast, Michael. I know in the past you've said, "Don't send me something if it's not peer reviewed," essentially, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you want to know that it's gone through that process so that I'm not going to waste my time on it. Yeah, and I'll I'll grant. You know, I I might be missing something good in something that somebody in the audience has been working on. I'll grant that because I've had questions uh, over the course of you know my teaching career from people in class, interacting on email, even in the podcast, where I'll get asked something, and that will change the way I think about something. You know, I'll think to myself, yeah, I need to really give that some time and reevaluate this or that, and. You know, over the course of years, I, I've actually changed you know, positions on a, on a handful of things because those interactions were part of that process. But the problem is, just look what you said, my time is so limited, I will take the risk and weed out the stuff that isn't peer-reviewed just because I only have time to read the stuff that is. So I'm, I'm hedging my bets there to, to mm-hmm. think if it's peer-reviewed, chances are I may come across something important. The chances are greater of that than something else. 
And for the people in the audience, when you go to do research, I think that's a, a good way to think about it. You know, I would never say don't read something that isn't peer reviewed because it's just junk. Again, that that is an overstatement. Right, but yeah. do focus on you know the things that you know uh, experts in the field have looked at. And they've considered, you know, thoughtfully because you know their their reputations are in part of the line too. They don't want they don't want their readership to turn around and say, "What? How in the world did this thing make it in there? This is embarrassing, or this is ridiculous, or or whatever." You know, and it's not a perfect process, but it's a good process for winnowing material and really, again, having field experts say, "Yes, this is worth your time to read and to think about." I've had the same experience too. You know, where sometimes you'll submit something to a journal, it gets turned turn back, it gets rejected, you submit it somewhere else. You know, it, it, there's all sorts of factors. Uh, it might not be something they're really interested in. You know, it, it might be, you know, boy, you missed the boat on this thing and then you get it back and you have to rework it. I've had at least one experience where I was convinced that the reviewers just didn't understand what I was trying to say. So there's the problem them or me, <laughs> you know, but you have to, you have to put that thought into it at least. Am I doing such a poor job of explaining this that they're just not getting it? And often you can tell by comments too. Right. Now that's, just, yeah, that's good. Just think how much better Twitter would be with peer review too. <laughs> <laughs> I almost want to say just how much better Twitter would be if it wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll confess, I, I use it and kind of kind of like it for the most part. But yeah, yeah, it, it would be nice to winnow some of that stuff. Um, now that, but that's all with with journals. Um, now, again, an academic journal is a place, a publication, where scholars are, are essentially writing for scholars. But that's not always the case. I mean, can, let's talk a little bit about the different kinds of journals and what's the difference between a journal and a periodical and a magazine. How do you explain that to your students? Because I know you do it in the book, but do it for us here. Danny, why don't you take that? Yeah, sure. The example I usually give to my students is – you know, take a big name person who you really like. So most people, you know, so I say, take N.T. Wright. Uh, we all respect him. He's very prolific. And imagine that you come across an article that he wrote in Christianity Today. And then imagine coming across uh, a periodical or a, a journal article in Journal for the Study of the New Testament from a guy you've never heard of. Um, and they're on the same topic. Which one is, you know, weightier in my eyes as as your marker. So I said, you know, if you're using this in a paper and the weightier one is the journal article. And that's because that person is uh, trying to put forth a sustained argument, trying to make a sustained point, a thesis, and it's been peer reviewed as opposed to N.T. Wright, who I deeply respect. But in Christianity Today, um, it's being edited pretty much for grammar and spelling. And mm -hmm. he's giving his an his opinion on the matter. And I may fully agree with that opinion, but he is not uh, engaging with the wider academic discussion in that piece. He will yeah. elsewhere in, in a book or a journal article. But those are the differences. You're talking about an opinion piece versus uh, an academic argument that is trying to make a sustained point. I think that's good. And in that example, I would challenge students who are thinking about that example to look at the bibliography. And in the Christianity Today piece, he might cite one or two other scholars to, you know, support his thesis, uh, whereas the the peer-reviewed journal will have something much more substantive. And so that just shows the the interaction with ideas. And so it's going to give the students a bigger picture of the conversation on that specific topic. Yeah. And, and the other thing, I want to get into Bible dictionaries, too, because this is a tool that a lot of people in our audience are going to have access to. And the importance of using them, and they're all those. Those are different too. But as good as one of the as that resource would be, a Bible dictionary. You know, you might have space four or five pages, maybe even two columns a page, you know, to discuss something. Whereas a journal article could be two or three times as long, and is designed to interact with sort of the the previous work on that subject. Whereas a dictionary is going to be is going to try to just give you the lay of the land in as much detail as the space permits. There are two different kinds of things, and they, they're going to serve you in different ways. But journal articles, again, are, are often more in-depth for this reason. They get, they get more space to, to develop something, develop a, an argument. They have to, by definition, interact with what people have said before in that article uh, in, a, in a substantive way. 
And then what they say about the prior work and, and then some corrective they advance or some, some way to, you know, contribute to the discussion, that has to be coherent. Uh, so those kinds of sources, things that go on through peer review, uh, I, I just believe are really the most valuable. Unfortunately, they're also the hardest to access in, in certain situations because they, they don't, it's not just put out on the internet, you know, for free. But for people trying to do serious research that have access to that material, say, through a library or through you know, software or, or something like that, this is, the kind of, this is how you want to be thinking about your sources. What kind of space do they devote to it? Who do they interact with? You know, what scholars do they interact with? Are they just sort of putting forth their opinion or are they taking, taking part in a bigger discussion and really analytically – going through the, the, the parts of that discussion, interacting with people that might disagree with them as, you know, as opposed to you know, being on their side. That, that's the best kind of stuff because it makes you think about more things, makes you think more deeply about what it is you're doing. But that's all journals. Okay, what about books? I get, here's a question I get all the time, and you go into it a little bit in, in, in the book, again, in, in the research section of the book. How do we evaluate publishers? Mm. Are all publishers created equally? <laughs> you know, do they, do they, th th this is sort of like inside baseball kind of stuff because as scholars, we kind of get a feel for who publishes what and why. But yeah. the wider community, again, like, like this podcast audience, they might have no inkling of that, and it's like, mm -hmm. hey, it it it, it appears it's in, on paper in between two covers, and it's on a table, you know, it's on a shelf, in a store, you know, that that, that must mean it's okay. Well, it, not all publishers are created equally, so let let's talk about how give our audience some advice on how they can just vet or or understand might be a better word um, the different publishers. I would start by just challenging them to recognize there is a continuum. Of publishers, mm -hmm. and each publisher has a different purpose and, and intent. Some are to present the latest and the greatest of scholarship, and some are really focused on the, the lay individual in the church. Uh, some try to do a little bit of both, and so they kind of find themselves somewhere in the middle. They're not going to be on the high academic side, but they're also going to be maybe more academic than what the everyday church member is looking for. So I guess I'd start just by helping them think through uh, the continuum and see their, their bookshelf on that continuum. Um, and, you know, as they begin to think that way, they'll be able to identify where certain publishers fall on that. So that's my start to the answer. Danny, I'd like for your thoughts on finishing it. Yeah. I, I usually say to students, if, so in Canada, it's there's Christian bookstores like Blessings and uh, Miracles. They're probably similar to the States, but maybe there's some other ones like that. But generally, generally I tell my students, if you find it there, it's usually not always – it's usually not going to be an academic publisher. And it's not to denigrate those either. So again, just like Mike was you know, trying to say, we're not – we're not denigrating those that aren't peer reviewed. It's just that it's at a different level and it's at a different conversation. So in my uh, area anyway, if it's at one of those more pop level books stores, it's usually not going to be an academic discussion type of book. Those are what you usually find at either strictly academic bookstores, perhaps on your university campus, or if you find it actually in the library. It tends to be that university libraries, academic libraries, don't so much carry the trade type books. They focus on the academic books. Mm -hmm. That's Mike. a good illustration. You know, like the difference between a public library, their, their religion section in a public library, as opposed to a university library. Because the, those two libraries are going to be buying different things. Mm -hmm. They're going to have the, the university library is going to have a bigger budget for one thing, but they're going to be targeting academic publishers to to put stuff on their shelves. The public library isn't really necessarily going to be doing that. They're going to be looking for more of the popular publisher, just because of you know who they imagine their customer to be. One mm -hmm. is a student in a degree program. The other one is just somebody in the community. Go ahead. Um, specifically with your audience, what types of – what are they gearing at when they ask you this question about publishers? 
are they trying to know who to trust? Are they trying to know how to um, categorize different publishers? There, there's a lot of the of the former. You know, hey, you know, who who's trustworthy? You know, who mm-hmm. who do you recommend here? But part of the recommendation they want to know is is who does good research. Okay. Um, and, and you know, like a, there are some publishers where you can you can give the same name to both of those questions, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, you you might even sacrifice a little bit on the academic end to someone who's like not in a degree program or doesn't have the the sort of academic experience to wade through and and sift the weed from the chaff, so to speak. My my tendency is actually to do that to, to try to recommend a publisher like let, let's let's just take InterVarsity Press. I mean, InterVarsity Press, you know, really tries to to produce academic material. They have an evangelical you know orientation to what they do, so that that's going to you know be in in, in the background when they get book proposals. They're they're going to be vetting. Uh, potential books based on you know do you sort of fit within our our evangelical orientation you know doctrinally theologically and it's going to be broad but it's it's still going to be the evangelical tradition and then you know academically is this is this something that is is up to snuff or are they interacting well with literature do they focus on primary text you know it's it's that sort of thing there there's still something I don't know if I want to call it a peer review process, but depending on how your editorial process works, uh, there is some some peer review kind mm-hmm. of thing going on there. Uh, so you have publishers. You know, Lexum is younger, and Lexum is, is is trying to sort of model themselves a bit after InterVarsity. Uh, we have some people on staff that used to work there. They're they're probably going to. You know they're going to pick their own direction and and maybe not do some things in varsity would just because of subject interest. Um, but you have publishers like that, and those are the ones I I really try to to get people to focus on Baker Academic. And we mm-hmm. can talk about the differences here without that there is a difference between varsity and Erdman's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And well, it's and it's typically theological. But go ahead. Just you know. there is also what one of the things I found interesting is I got into it is there's also a difference between Baker and Baker academic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so recognizing that each of, not each of them, but a lot of the publishers in kind of the mainstream evangelical world have a trade arm and an mm-hmm. academic arm. And so when Zondervan publishes something, it's not always one of their, their academic lines, or sometimes it's not geared toward, you know, the lay individual. It's more geared towards an academic Right, and and that and that's how you would define trade versus academic. A trade book, again, someone they're they're going to be targeting the the lay person in the church. Academic, you know, sort of speaks for itself. Someone who is maybe you know in the college or in seminary or a pastor, but you know the pastor is going to drift over to the trade books as well. But but again, it, it, it's a different audience orientation. But I'm glad you brought that up because Baker is a good example. You know, they mm-hmm. they have their their trade line and they have their academic line. And if people go to the websites of the publishers, they that's usually pretty distinguishable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where they where they lead someone who lands on their website. Yeah, and you can also, I mean, do you, if if a person isn't entirely sure, most of the time, if you flip to the back of the book. And if the bibliography is pretty long, then chances are you're looking at an academic book. <laughs> yeah. 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 Are there footnotes? Okay. Yeah, exactly. E- even even now this isn't this isn't as hard and fast as it used to be. But even footnotes versus endnotes. Yes, or footnotes you, you, versus in text notes. Yeah, mm-hmm. or yeah, exactly. So usually an academic book would give you the footnote material as you read. Because the assumption is that, that you're the kind of reader that wants to look at the footnote. If they're at the end, then it's like, oh, you don't really care so much about that. Again, that that the assumption there would be that's a less you know academically inclined reader. Now that isn't again a, a, like I said as hard and fast as it used to be, but that used to be like a a, a layout decision or, or even mm-hmm. a even a, a publication decision. You know that this is the kind of book this is, so this is the way we do this thing over here. Yeah, um, but yeah, there are ways. That, does it have an index, bibliography, footnotes? The more of that kind of stuff you get, that will telegraph to you that that this was intended as an academic work. 
you know, by, by this publisher. Do we want to say anything about publishers? You know, what, what's your percept? And these, these are all sort of, if we get into this, it, it, you know, I, I think it's fair to say these are sort of impressions. I mean, I could, mm-hmm. I could share impressions about publishers. Um, but do we want to say anything about, Hey, what's the difference between Zondervan, Erdman's, InterVarsity, Craigle, Baker? I mean, they, because you know you have a continuum there too mm-hmm. in a spectrum, yeah. so feel free. They all do different things for me, I, I think. And you know, I look at my library, and I've got a lot of er- Erdman's commentaries. You know, I think they do a really good job with the uh, NICOT and NT and then the pillar commentary. Um, I'm redesigning a class right now for spiritual formation on uh, at Liberty, and. I seem to be drifting towards a lot of crossway books right now. Um, and that's not always how it is, but right now that seems to be what I'm seeing them publish a lot of and what I'm finding value in in their publications. And so I think each publisher has areas that they try to identify with. And to me, that help, that's helpful. Uh, the more you read, obviously, the more you're going to figure out those uniquenesses for each publisher. Um, they all have kind of different denominational bins Mm -hmm. or you know maybe some of them may not have a denominational bin but they might just be broader in their evangelical uh commitments um and so that's i think that's healthy in a lot of ways what do you think danny yeah and i was gonna say some are some are lightning focused they'll tend to be a little more lightning focused and sometimes it's just because they're publishing dissertations or whatever it may be so publishers like brill eisenbrons and uh Peters, sometimes they're like lightning focused, whereas Erdman's and Baker, uh, Baylor, they'll they'll tend to be a, a little more wide ranging their titles. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They have a little they have a little more impact and implication on a wider uh, aspect of New Testament or Old Testament study. And uh, all of the, again, all of those are good things. We need we need both. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, some publishers will publish, for instance a work that might be more critically oriented. In other words, again, I hate to caricature it, but I'll, for, again, I think this is a good way to say it for the sake of the audience, that there would be some um, books that the the author might not have as, quote, high view of scripture, unquote, you know, as as somebody else. In other words, they're, they're, they're more open to uh, questioning things like a point of inerrancy or, or you know, some sort of of affirmation or denial that this or that person wrote this or that book. So, you know, your, your editorial staff at a, at a, at a publisher would say, well, we don't really want to, we don't really want to publish that because it's kind of, you know, to the left or outside the orbit of the evangelical mainstream, again, whatever that is, but that they, they have a, they have a picture of that in their head and, and who their readership is predominantly. And so they'll, they'll defer on one title and pick another one because of some sort of critical thing. It, Maybe a superficial example here is you might have a publisher that would publish a commentary on Daniel o- only if it didn't take a late date authorship view. Again, other publishers won't care, you know, what what view of the, of the authorship of Daniel, you know, that that the, the author has. We'll, we'll publish, you know, either either or early late. Who cares? And, and another publisher might reject one or the other for you know for that reason. You we we want to. We want to be. We don't want to be known as the publisher who published this thing over here. So they'll they'll do things like that. Some publishers will publish uh, a charismatic book and a non charismatic book. You'll see, you'll see the same both of those in the same catalog. Other ones won't. You know, well we're we're in this tradition. We're the reformed tradition. We're not going to publish anything that we feel is too Arminian. You know, so they'll they'll just make decisions like that. And you can you can sort of pick that up by by experience. My experience has been that if you ask them, they'll tell you. <laughs> you know, they'll just they'll just sort of give give you what they're looking for and what they're not looking for. Uh, so again, well, if they, you ever have a question, just I would say ask the publisher. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll also tell you. have their doctrinal statement a lot of times yep. written down for you online. Yeah, and you'll be able to see where are they going to be. Right? How you broad know? or how narrow is it at this yeah. or that place? And, yeah. And a lot of times those, you know, they make sense as you go on. I was having a conversation with PNR about a book idea and they said, well, as long as it fits within the Westminster Confession of Faith. And 
I right. thought, oh, that makes sense. But I didn't know that was a requisite. It's, it's Puritan and reform, that would yes, make sense. Yes, absolutely. It makes great sense. <laughs> you know, and so all of a sudden, you now know with that little bit of information, PR is going to be consistent with the Westminster. Mm-hmm. Um, I was looking at Craigle earlier today, and their doctrinal statement is up on their, their website for potential authors. Um, and so a lot of times they'll tell you what, what they believe and where they stand. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, listeners should know that. You, not all publishers are created equal. They have different audiences in mind. They have different ways that they want to sort of brand themselves. They've all got different, you know, doctrinal commitments or not. Uh, some, you know, will publish, the, the higher end publishers, you know, they're going to get a lot of dissertations. It's a lot of nuts and bolts work you know, in primary sources and reviews of other literature in, in, in that book, it, they're just not all the same. And so what you want is you want something that, as, as you guys have laid out both here and in the book, if you, if you want to, you know, have sort of a high level of comfort or a reasonable level of comfort that, that this is an academic work, you know, that, that has, you know, that the author has put, you know, some serious time into the subject and the people who publish this have, vetted it for that reason, have approved it for that reason. Does it have footnotes? Okay. Are there a lot of footnotes? Does it have a substantial bibliography? Does it have an index? Again, these are the marks of something that's a little more serious than not. Yeah. Um, you know, that it's just, just handy ways to tell. Uh, another question. I was going to say, Mike, we don't forget too. if you want your book to be totally out of price range, but you also want it to survive <laughs> yeah, the apocalypse, right. you go with Brill. <laughs> right. Right. We all, we've all had the experience of of you know <laughs> wondering you know at what what bank will give me a loan <laughs> for the brittle <laughs> table. <laughs> oh, they're outrageous, but you know that, they've been around for 250 around, years. Right. <laughs> you know, they they can get away with that. Uh, and, and you know that's actually that's actually a decent point to make because publishers like that, you've got Brill, Peters, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, they, they used to think it was a sin to put anything in paperback because it might lower the price. You know, it, yeah. uh, those kind of publishers, they know up front that anything they publish, li- a certain number of libraries are going to buy it. That's right. And so they, they can literally put something out on the first day knowing that they will meet their costs based on how many libraries will, will buy anything they do. And that means that the layperson is just, or the individual customer suffers because they can charge you whatever they want. They don't need your purchase to break even on their project or to, or to make a profit. They've already done that with the libraries. So they can get away with it. So yeah. they do. It's just the way it is. I was going to say, just to add one more thing to it, the, the reason it is important to start, especially at this uh, kind of time and stage in, in the publishing realities that you need to evaluate a book by opening it is because, you know, there are good publications coming out from uh, essentially something like self publication. Mm-hmm. So there are still, you know, and, you know, I think about uh, Rick Brannon, right? So his, mm-hmm. his yeah. lexical commentaries on the pastoral epistles are fantastic, <laughs> but that was essentially, you know, it's just a step up from self publication, but, they're still highly academic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, be- because, you know, we've had Rick on the, on the podcast before, again, because of the association with, with uh, Logos, people, you know, have gotten to know him a little bit more. And, and he blogged, you know, I, I think he still blogs, you know, with a, a decent amount of frequency, but people have gotten to know him that he, he's a nuts and bolts guy, you know, the text, and he puts these things together and, and you're right. It, you know, it, <laughs> He he. It's convenient that he can you know publish this you know through through Lexum or even he was putting stuff out by himself you know, yeah. but he's done all this work, and it's still really good stuff. Yeah. And enough people know him now, I think, and, and can trust what he does that they they understand that. But you're right. That, that's a good point. Again, it, it, especially this day and age, you know, that you can still produce things and essentially do them on your own, and it it can still be good good material. Now it's great if you have a name that you've, you've published things before, you know, in, you know, regular publications or journal articles or whatnot, then you go out and do self publishing. It's still you. Okay. You're still the same guy, you know, or girl, you know, do, doing that. So that helps too, but you can find lots of good stuff, uh, you know, doing that. Another question. Why, um, 
let me let me throw this one out. What can a library give you that the internet won't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, it, there's tons of great stuff on the internet. So, and, and there's lots of good books on the internet too. Like, if they're past... say like like Wikipedia. Is <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. So, like, uh, you know, I'm thinking of something like ar- archive.org, for instance. So, there is still really good classic biblical studies material that is now outside of copyright and so it is on the internet for anyone but that was a you know published book with a good academic publisher Mm -hmm. and it's just that it's out of copyright now and so you know that just happened to me i'm I'm reviewing a, a book and he mentioned a series and I noticed the date and I said, Oh man, that, that should be available on archive.org. It was called beginnings of Christianity. And yeah, four volumes are on archive.org that I can use there. And it's, you know, that was considered one of the monumental volume uh, four five volume series on the book of acts for such a long time. And it's still cited today and that's freely available online. Um, but newer books, newer publications, like you said before, with, with journal articles, they're just not freely available because they're still under copyright. Yeah, exactly. Um, t- just talking about libraries. Okay. W- again, why, one of the big questions I think, you know, to, to sort of narrow our focus here before we get into some method issues, there are going to be a lot of people in this audience. They don't live near a university. They don't live near a seminary. Obviously they have the internet, but what, what advice do you, do you give them for how to do good research. I mean, archive.org is a good source. Do you have other suggestions? Um, well, I was going to say, I don't want it to be a, a shameless plug, but I think Logos is a great resource for people who don't have that library. Um, one of the things that is helpful is a lot of schools or universities are um, opening up a lot more digital sources that can be free, uh, mm-hmm. journal articles, et cetera. Um, but if you have gone to a school that doesn't allow alumni into their their services, or if you've never gone to school and so you don't have a a school to go back to and to go to their online library, something like Logos where you can build a repository, but also find things that may be outside of the, just the, the common Google searches or scholar search, scholar dot Google searches, Mm -hmm. um, I think would be a, a wise investment of your time, especially if you enjoy this process of researching. Yeah, well, like Mike was saying, or Mike, you were saying too, like Brill publishes knowing that primarily it's libraries that are going to buy their volumes, right? And that's, mm-hmm. you know, that that's somewhat true of all of the academic presses. Like their their main focus is the libraries and kind of the higher tier scholarship, as opposed to trade books. So they're hoping lots of people, the general populace, is some of those people are going to buy it. So what that means for your listeners is that those academic works are largely, they're sitting in libraries. <laughs> they're mm-hmm. sitting on library shelves unless they've been digitized at a place like Logos, Bible Software, or whatever it might be. But there are, there's kind of the two stages of doing research, right? It's actually finding what is the stuff I should be reading, and mm-hmm. then there's the actual getting of it. Mm-hmm. And so the finding of the things uh, in the book, we mentioned ATLA or ATLAS, ATLA, Mm-hmm. which is kind of the main database, uh, but it is a subscription. So if you're, if you don't have connection to a university, um, I can, can I, do you mind if I throw it just a few other options? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah so, go ahead. And you know, so scholar.google.com was mentioned, but there are three other online databases that are free and searchable. And again, this is just the finding the content, not the actual resource yet. But uh, one is Index Theologicus, so it's I X T H E O dot D E Ichthio like that. And then mm-hmm. there's um, the documentation for biblical literature Innsbruck, so it's Innsbruck University, and that's called Bildi B I L D I. And then there's another one called Bible B I B I L, and that's the biblical bibliography of Lasan. And so all of these are free. And you can search by title, by keyword, by author. And so that's finding, you know, the relevant mm-hmm. literature on the topic. It's not right. Yet- it's like a it's like a card catalog or searching through a bibliography. Exactly. Exactly. And and those those are useful. You know, it um like you said, that, that gets you to what you need to read. Then the question becomes, well, how do I get that thing? You know, and, and that becomes more of an obstacle. A, a lot of the 
I think the trend, it's fair to say, I mean, Logos obviously has a lot of stuff and we license from, I don't know, probably now 170, 180 different publishers. And a number of those are the high end academic ones. So the software, I would think that the software for someone who's not living near a library, the software is good just for that reason alone, you know, even without the databases and reverse interlinears and all that kind of stuff. Um, just to have access to a lot of that that material, and and we do we we have been able to license some journals as well, not as many as we'd like, but you can get to an awful lot, you know, through the software. So I'm I'm glad you mentioned it, uh, Ben. That, that's true. I've also you know noticed a trend in publishers that they're trying to make more of their content digital through subscriptions. So have either of you ever tried any of those? I have the advantage, probably Ben's the same too, is that because we're connected with the university, it's, it's, we just have it because we're faculty. So I can't speak to being outside of university because <laughs> I've been in sec- <laughs> post-secondary education for so yeah. long. <laughs> but, they're, uh, they're still a little pricey, but yeah. you know, they're, I, I think what you would pay for basically one Brill volume, you, know, you, you might be able to get a <laughs> subscription you know, for, you know, to, to some reference book. You know, or some reference resource that that uh, you know a, a publisher like Brill or Oxford or Cambridge you know would have. So it, I, I you know, you, you have to you have to sort of measure the price. They might want this is just a number plucked out of my head. I don't know if this is the case. They might want a hundred dollars, you know, annual subscription, a hundred bucks, you know, to to access their dictionary series, you know, Oxford or something like that. But that's actually worth it. Uh, because if they give you access to a lot of their reference materials for that price, well, I mean, you could spend a hundred bucks on their website in just one title. Mm-hmm. Right. So it th- those has, kinds of things are still worth it. Has Logos thought about doing some of th- something like that? Yeah, we've thought about doing subscription. There is a subscription uh, program, Logos Now, where uh, you can again you can get access to the materials for a, a pretty low you know, monthly price. And that, and that's the logic too. Mm-hmm. you know, you allow the consumer to, you know, you, you pay the monthly price. They essentially use what they, what they want, you know, what they mm-hmm. care about yeah. as opposed to buying a software package and they get, you know, 200 books that they're not really going to use. You know, it, it, it just depends on the consumer. Some people yeah. will use most of that stuff. Some people won't use any of it. So yeah, that that's a new trend. I think it's going to continue. I think the academic world is going to go the way of, you know, Netflix and, you know, Amazon Prime. <laughs> Just people are used to that. It it makes sense, you know, to offer something like that. So sure, why not? Have any of you tried now? You're you're still attached to university, so maybe you haven't, or but maybe you still know the situation. Do your libraries connected with your institutions allow people in the community, okay, to get like a borrower's card or a bar a, a borrower's number? that will allow remote access. And then the sub question to that is could somebody in Hawaii get the same privilege, you know, in other words, pay for a borrower identification number so that they can access your material uh, over the internet. You, are you aware? You know, Mike, I don't know about that, but I, I would imagine, and this is just Liberty. And again, it would need to be, I don't know if I should say this, but, I would imagine if if someone applied to Liberty online, paid the fifty dollar application fee, they would then be given a student ID and a login. And mm-hmm. whether they take classes or not, I would assume that they would have access to the library. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, that's I'm, the same for me as well, but I I can't say a hundred percent for sure. Yeah, so, not. I mean, I've never registered, so I I can't affirm or deny that either. <laughs> but it, if they do that, that's a great deal. It, it will be a great deal. I mean, yeah. it's a, it's actually a clever idea that you just kind of implanted in my mind and maybe the landy, mind of your uh, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can I can speak from experience as a community person. When we moved to Washington State, for some reason, University of Wisconsin just does not have the best alumni warmth <laughs> <laughs> that other institutions do. I mean, I we can get to certain things, but but you can't like like I can't access the online the, the databases like Atla for free. I mean, maybe they've changed it. I, it's been so long since I looked, but I couldn't. So what I did was I drove over to Trinity Western. It was twenty minutes away, and said, "Hey, you know, can I get a library card?" And sure, you know, paid for the library card. That gives me an ID number, and 
I can use the databases from anywhere. Now, if I mm. want to, at the time, I haven't tried it for quite a while because, you know, I have a, an institutional ID now, but for a while, I could not download like a, a, an article in PDF from my house. I would have to go and be in the library to do that. But I know other institutions don't have that restriction. If you have a borrowing privilege, if you have a, an ID number and you can access their holdings, um, you know, from, from a distance, you can actually still get to material in PDF with that identification number. I okay. think that you would be able to at Liberty. I think that's how their system is set up. Yeah. It, it, again, for our listeners, if, if you want to tap into not just journals, but high-end reference books that are in digital form that publishers license to you know, colleges and universities, whole books, you know, whole series of books, this is the thing you know, that, that you really need to try to do. You need to try to get, you know, create that institutional affiliation or, or go directly to the library. And then you can get access to a lot of this material. Well, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about, you know, hey, what stuff should I look for? What stuff shouldn't I look for? Um, and, and, and nobody, uh, I hope listeners, you know, heard this. Nobody landed on the side of the internet's just a total waste of time. Don't ever use it. No, that's right. I mean, there, it, it actually does have some good purposes and some good content on it, but. Again, we, we talked about peer review, we talked about differences in publishers, you know, hey, what what should I look for? What's an academic book? What isn't? All that sort of thing. But what you guys do in the book, other than that stuff, you, you sort of do two things. You talk about how to research a topic, and then you give, you know, some some practical advice on if you get tied into formal education, how to sort of navigate that, how to balance it with life. Um, you know, in other words, examining why am I pursuing formal education? How do I balance my home life, my church life, you know, with this? So I want to talk about both of those things, uh, you know, before we, we finish the episode. Where should people start when they're researching a topic? So just talk about how you would recommend uh, what you do recommend to your students about starting off. And then once you're, you're you get your feet wet, where do you go from there? So just give us an overview of that. Mm, yeah. Good question. Yeah. I always tell my students to start with Bible dictionaries. So I just, I love mm -hmm. Bible dictionaries and it's because of what you said before, Mike, they're designed to give you a lay of the land. Mm -hmm. And so depending on which Bible dictionary you look at, looking at, it may be a super quick <laughs> lay of the land and not necessarily helpful beyond, you know, a basic definition of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But uh, others like the, you know, the IVP Black Dictionary set or Anchor uh, Bible Dictionary, uh, these, are, these are quite comprehensive. And so once you read that, you have a good sense of what's going on in the field uh, regarding that topic. Bible Dictionaries, by the way, uh, for your listeners, just in case they don't know, it's not like Merriam-Webster Dictionary that you're looking up a definition. <laughs> it's more like an encyclopedia, right? So you're looking up mm -hmm. topics, people, places, and things. And the other reason that the Bible dictionaries are so good is because they always, uh, especially the bigger ones, they always end with a bibliography. Yep. So, so you got a ready-made bibliography ready to go there. Um, it doesn't take more than you know looking at two or three places max. As long as you're looking at the right places, you can you can build a list of other things to look at quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is why you should care about footnotes. <laughs> Yeah, this is why you should care about using academic books that do have footnotes and bibliographies. They will tell you where else to look. They'll 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 give you the next thing to go chase down. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't if you don't have that, honestly, if, if if you're reading a book that doesn't help you go beyond that book itself, that's kind of a waste of time. I mean, it it, it really is. It, it it might be wonderful for one or two thoughts, but it's like, oh, great. Well, I still have five or six other questions, and you didn't help me with those. Where do I go? And again, if they haven't give you given you a breadcrumb trail in footnotes and bibliography, then well, dead end. Yeah, and I would say I mean, again, we've we've mentioned Logos a few times, but there's a great dictionary that's accessible for free to everyone, and yep. that's the Lexham Bible Dictionary. I mean, I always tell my students, you know, when they hum and haw over the price of the IVP Black Dictionary, just, I'll just say, you know, get your Logos account and download the the, the Lexham Bible Dictionary. It's awesome. It's huge. Uh, it's really good articles, and it's the newest Bible Dictionary, so it, it's the most up-to-date one right now. 
Yeah, all you got to do is, I mean, you could just Google like Faith Life Study Bible. And yep. I, if you create the account there, uh, you'll get the, the Lexham Bible Dictionary with the Study Bible. So yeah, yeah exactly. it doesn't cost you anything. It's through your app or through your web browser or through Logos if you have Logos. So yeah, yeah. So, okay, you, you start them off with Bible dictionaries. They, they find a good entry. There's, there's an excellent entry, by the way, in the, in the IVP uh, Dictionary of Poetry and Wisdom on the Divine Council. I highly recommend <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah. but, there's, a, there's a few really good ones in the Lexham Bible Dictionary, too, right. by, by me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for this, for this podcast, uh, listeners can go to logos.com. That's L-O-G-O-S.com slash naked bible and again there go up there create an account there's some you know material there that it's a picture of trey without his shirt on no it's not a picture of trey without his shirt on please don't don't give anyone that idea (laughs) actually that would sell like hotcakes that's exactly what they need to do yeah, Mike, well, we need to look into getting like a calendar or something. God you know, forbid, naked Bible yeah. calendar. <laughs> uh, no, they're 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 going to offer you know some deals for listeners and whatnot. But again, there's just a lot of a lot of stuff that you you don't have to pay you know the 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 high dollar amounts to just get your your feet wet and get into some really good starter resources. So you know if you haven't done that, you you really need to check it out. Um, beyond the Bible dictionaries, okay. What, what's the next step? Okay, I've read that. I kind of get the lay of the land. I, I, I sort of know what I'm looking for. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, to sort of, you know, jump into this topic. Where do people go from there? What's your advice, your research advice? Danny, keep going, because you said you laid out the students. You tell them to start mm-hmm. there. What's your next step in yeah, the process? So, again, so for me, coming from a biblical studies perspective, it's looking at a Bible dictionary, and then it's looking at uh, one or two of the, what I would say, kind of like, I tell them the top technical commentaries and I can um, expand on how to know that for sure. But when you go to something like Word Biblical Commentary and you read about the passage that you want to write on or that you want to study, again, looking at their footnotes or looking at the bibliography for that passage will, in you know, first off, you'll see overlap from some of the Bible dictionaries because mm-hmm. uh, they're using, they're in conversation with one another but it will add to your list. And again, by the time you look at, you know, two commentaries and one or two Bible dictionaries, you got a substantial list of resources to look at. Yeah. And with Word, you know, Word is, is a higher end commentary. They will not produce like Hebrew and Greek in transliteration. So that, that's an obstacle. But that's not what you're talking about. You're not talking about, hey, after a Bible dictionary, you know, you, you're going to magically read Greek and Hebrew. So go to the Word Bible commentary. You know, that's not the point. It's, when you go to the word biblical commentary, at each section they have bibliography, like up front, you know, they have the, the verses that they're going to discover, like Genesis one one through three. You know, before you they you even hit the discussion, they've given you a, a lot of resources that the writer will have will be interacting with in the course of what you read. But just use it for that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, who, who cares if Good. you can read you know the Greek or Hebrew? Right, right there, they've just given you a whole block of journal articles and dictionary entries. I mean, it, it, that's just worth, again, the, the time alone, just to read through the bibliography. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about Word, Bible, Word Biblical Commentary. I wish more commentaries had that format. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the rest of them, really, it's you're looking at the footnotes yep. uh, and seeing what they're quoting as they discuss that passage, and you're, you'll, find, uh, you'll find the information there. So it's, it's kind of that those are the two steps that I would right. I say. And then the third one is, in particular, if you're going for a really exhaustive look at something, you know, so if you're working on a thesis or a PhD, obviously you're, you're supposed to be a lot more exhaustive. And n- not every single thing is going to be listed there. And that's when you would go to those online databases like Atla mm-hmm. or Index Theologicus, those types of places. But for most for most students and, and for your listeners, a good Bible dictionary and a good uh, technical commentary is going to give them uh, plenty of things to read and interact with. Yeah, I, I would agree. LBD, Lexham Bible Dictionary, the University set, Anchor Bible Dictionary. Th- those those are sets that you know I would hope all my listeners would have access to. The Lexham, there's no excuse because it's free. Uh, the other ones, again, are, are, are highly recommended, but I know when I when I have written for these publications, they you know they only give you a certain amount of of, of word count, and so 
you know, and, and they'll restrict the number of sources often. So what you're trying to do as a person contributing to one of these things is what are the best things? What are the best resources I can put in the bibliography? Because I only have a certain amount of space. What's going to be the most helpful? So that, again, that's why you should use these things. The, 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 the person producing the content for that thing is trying, again, to, to help you get to the best material possible. Um, I, I don't know if is is the old Isby on archive.org. Do, do you know that, Danny? I don't know. Um, and I mean, yeah. you, you might actually be able to find um, the old ISBE International Standard Bible Encyclopedia somewhere, you know, really reproduced in PDF or something like that, because it's it's out of print. It's been replaced. I don't know, probably decades ago now. Yeah, it is uh, there. It is there. see that for many, many years. Isby was the standard. Yep. Bible encyclopedia, Bible dictionary. There it is for free. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've, you've got to, again, learn about some of these sources. That's what we're trying to do in this episode, to try to get you to some of these things. Um, and you can actually do a lot of good res- research, and you don't pay a dime for it. Yeah, and, and once you have those, again, if, you're, if you don't have any access with a library, again, if it's out of copyright, it's likely going to be on archive.org. Mm-hmm. And the other place I wanted to make sure I mentioned too, because it's a great spot, is biblicalstudies.org.uk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, I mean, that's amazing the amount of work that Rob Bradshaw has done there. And a lot of that is still in copyright, but but uh, Bradshaw chases down the authors and gets mm-hmm. permission from them. And so it's still there, even though it's not in the – for the publisher, it's it's still in copyright, but it's still there. And there are journals that uh, eventually put all, all of their stuff. So, for instance, if you went to biblicalstudies.org.uk and you typed in Heiser, you would see Mike's uh, article from Bulletin of Biblical Research because Bulletin of Biblical Research mm-hmm. does, I think, a four-year embargo. Yeah, so, something like that. Yeah, so after that, it's all online. So there is still, even without a university library, you could still uh, even now get – your hands on some some good journal articles and that's that's a prime spot Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely now uh we should say something about commentaries people could go up to my webpage drmsh.com and in the search field put in the word commentaries Uh, i would advise putting it in as a plural i did a a, i don't know how many parts it was a little, little bit of a series on you know what? What's the difference between commentaries? You know, they're not all commentaries again are created equal. But if we can summarize here, what's the what? How would you describe the differences between different kinds of commentaries that people could use? You want to take that, Ben? Yeah, um, I would say based on your your purpose, um, different commentaries accomplish like all books different purposes. And so, you know, every once in a while, I'll I'll use a commentary for a devotional. And I'll work my way through a commentary or a part of a commentary just devotionally. And in that context, I use more of a pastoral commentary. Um, I'm reading before bed at nighttime, you know, and that's been a blessing. Danny's talked about the commentaries he recommends that his students pursue um, after their first initial work with the Bible dictionary. And he wants them to pursue a higher end academic commentary. Visually, what's the difference? Visually, if I'm holding two commentaries, how are they going to how are they going to look different? How are they going to read differently? Um, well, the, so the wor- the academic commentary is going to have the languages right there. You're going to see them throughout. Um, for those of you who don't know the languages, that's going to be intimidating, and so you might want something a little less academic. Um, the pastoral commentary, or some sort of you know the the new application commentary, or the NIV application mm-hmm. commentary that Zondervan does. I enjoy that because it, it talks about the, the text and then it, it summarizes that section with some sort of application. And to me, I find that encouraging and edifying. Crossway has kind of the pastoral commentary that Kent Hughes has written. And I think those are, you know, they're very short. They're not, they don't have any footnotes. You know, it's not going to be something that uh, a professor is going to go, hey, great job. This was an awesome paper if that's all you have used Um, but if you're looking at something that's going to just be readable in in a setting like a nightly devotion that's a great idea does that kind of i mean yeah yeah i mean like a a pastoral commentary like you said would be something that summarizes it takes Mm -hmm. a section 
you know, of scripture. So, go, so going back summarizes to the primary research, with the very first question that we talked about, the script, the text is going to be the, the primary source. A pastoral devotional commentary is further down, you know, it, the line. It's not going to be, you know, it's going to summarize. It's not going to, it's not going to go to the languages and show you the linguistic work that it took to get to where they're drawing the conclusion. Right. And it's not help? even going to be, yeah, no, no, that, that helps. It, it's not even going to be verse by verse. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, 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 it might be tied to a particular translation. It's, it's, it's not going to be original language oriented. It's not going to be verse well, by it, verse. It might even be tied to their sermon outline. Yep. yep. You know, and, and to me, that's, there's a value in that. And especially based on the reader's skill level, you know, as the, the audience who's listening to this podcast, you know, they're all going to come with different abilities and different backgrounds. And of so some, that will be a fantastic resource. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think just like with books, you can visually tell the difference between, you know, a, a scholarly commentary, an academic one and the other. Uh, again, are there footnotes? Are there original languages in there? Are they doing Greek and Hebrew in there, even in transliteration, but especially if it's the Greek and Hebrew characters? You know, is it not only verse by verse, but even phrase by phrase? Well, that, if you're seeing that kind of stuff, that, that's an academic commentary. Yeah. And you, you have to have a certain set of skills to you know, basically have that be useful uh, to you. So if you're looking for something that's not that, well, then you, you, you want to pick up something that doesn't have that kind of stuff in it. It's more summarizing. Uh, you might have an application section in there. You might have the sermon outline, as, as you mentioned, Ben. They're just, there's a wide range of different kinds of, of commentaries that are aimed at you know, a different audience to try to accomplish different things. So it's not that one is, one is good, one is awful. It, it's, it's like, well, you can only really use evaluative terms like that when you judge them properly on what, what they're trying to do. That's a good you word. Know? You know, it, yeah. it's just, it's not fair. Yeah. And the academic commentaries too, unlike the pastoral or more devotional, they don't really get to the point of saying, so what does this mean <laughs> right. for me or for my community? And again, that's, yep. that's a perfectly valid question. It's yep. just that they're doing different things, right? So, and that, you know, an academic commentary is not ever going to really get to that point. And also you're going to be encountering kind of multiple perspectives Mm-hmm. on a passage in a technical commentary or an academic commentary, you'll get some of that in a in a more pastoral commentary because that kind of bridges the gap between devotional and, and still interacting with some of the academic discussion as opposed to something like a devotional commentary where you're really only kind of hearing one perspective for the most part on the passage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah, they're not going to take you through the, all the ins and outs of all the debates on this or that. You know, that, mm-hmm. that's what academic commentaries do. And a, and a, a pastoral devotional commentary, they're, they're just going to skip all that. They're, they're going to they're going to land somewhere immediately, and they're going to go from that perspective, and then they're going to talk about applying it, you know, to, to life and so on and so forth. So there there are a number of discernible differences uh, between you know the between different kinds of commentaries that people need to be aware of. To, to wind down, I want to I want to land on. So, what about the person in the audience who maybe they're in seminary now, or they're in maybe a you know graduate school, master's program, you know whatever, or even on a Bible college or you know whatever, some kind of formal educational situation. I can tell you right now, um, <laughs> you know my my experience I think is is sort of atypical. I've I've had the uh, how do I correctly, you know, assess or describe my situation? Um, it, it wasn't a, a continual horror story, but <laughs> it had it had lots of that in it. I, I, I had to work. I had to work full time. You know, I worked full time, really cumulatively, for 15 years. You know, going through graduate school. That's not something I recommend. It, it was just something that had to be done. I, it, it, there was there wasn't going to be another way to do it, and so it can be a real struggle. You know, other people, you know, don't, don't have anywhere near, you know, that sort of gauntlet you know, to travel through. And I, I don't regret it. Providentially, I think it was a wonderful thing. Uh, if that doesn't, that's not to say it was ever easy <laughs> because it wasn't, but I'm appreciative of it. But for people just generally, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into this. You might have to move. Sometimes you can't get an online situation. You know, why, why would, how should people think about 
getting into degree programs? Why would anybody do this? You know, why go to seminary? Why get a degree? Um, and if, if, you, if you take that leap, how do you just balance life, mm-hmm. you know, with, with your, your circumstances? How do, you, how do you live through the thing, you know, and, and do well and not destroy your family and yourself? Yeah. 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 I think, uh, I mean, everyone's uh, story is a little bit different. So, you mm-hmm. know, Ben, Ben, it was kind of this step by step, really feeling the strong, the spirit really saying, this is your next step. Mm-hmm. Never really knowing for me, uh, once I was done, uh, I went, I started with a one year Bible school out of college or out of, sorry, high school. And then I knew I wanted to study more. And then after, you know, the first year and a half at a undergrad college, I knew that I wanted to teach. And so the path essentially was laid for me at that point. If I wanted to teach in a seminary, New Testament, I needed to next get a grad level degree. And then next I needed to pursue a PhD. So in some ways, it was kind of the vocation that I was aiming for. I knew what I needed to do. I think everybody should do it because I think it's one of the greatest blessings of my life. And that's, you know, again, biased by my own experience. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a joy to wake up and to study but it's also exhausting and yeah. it's it's mentally exhausting and in some way somehow it's physically exhausting when you just find yourself sitting there in a library for hours upon hours and i think that's surprising to students i think students expect oh i'm coming to seminary and it's going to be like church camp um <laughs> there's going to be this spiritual high Everybody's in my corner. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and they get here and it's, it's just different. Um, I know my first semester of seminary, again, I mentioned I came from an education background. Um, I saw that they were offering Romans and I was like, they have a class on Romans. This is going to be awesome. And so I jumped in my first semester and I took Romans and you know, I go to the bookstore and they hand me uh, Moo's commentary with a new international commentary in the New Testament. And, you know, that was a textbook. <laughs> and I open it up and I'm like, I don't understand Uh-oh. these words mean. <laughs> Uh-oh. And I remember just reading and going, I'm not stupid, but this makes no sense. And so, you know, I came in and I just remember kind of hitting this crisis of what am I doing here? I don't get it. And so, Part of my challenge to students is to to walk themselves through the seminary calling in a proper order. Uh, one of the things I think Danny and I both, the reason we wrote this book is because we wish we both would have had this book in our own uh, initial seminary uh, experience. And so, you know, when you come and you are expecting this. You, this you don't like the white knuckle experience. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, you're expecting this this time where you're really just going to grow, and you do grow, but not always equally in your intellect, in your relationship with the Lord. You know, sometimes those come in different ways. I'm, this is a long answer, but I remember at one time in my seminary experience, I was just kind of burnt out. And I remember just going to a, a local bookstore and just saying, I'm not looking for anything academic. I need to find a book that tells me Jesus loves me. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked through all the topics, you know, and I, I find a, a Brennan Manning book. And I'm like, oh, he's going to tell me Jesus loves me. I, I just need to remember just the, the simplicity uh, of the gospel and of my faith. And so I challenge students to create times in their own life to remember that. Uh, if you have a family, you know, tell your family your wife or your husband or your kids or your parents, hey, would you call me after the first month of seminary and remind me of the gospel? Remind me that I have a calling because I'm going to get in over my head pretty quickly. Um, You know, my kids are learning how to swim this summer. And at the beginning of the summer, um, my four-year-old, he wouldn't put his face in the water. You know, uh, yesterday we were going um, swimming and he jumps in the water and goes under and comes back up. The water will recede you will be able to breathe again. But it's disconcerting that first time you're dunked under and you're, you know, the white knuckle experience. Yeah, I was going to say too, the other thing that uh, for me of why a degree, why into a program, why into a seminary is that you really need to trust 
in the mentorship and guidance that's given to you. And that's not only one-on-one stuff, but it's also the degree and program itself. Mm -hmm. And this really came home to me, really only in hindsight, because once I became a faculty member, we had to go through a curriculum review process. And it was at that point that I realized, okay, the, the faculty members actually sit around and with all of their ministry experience, their scholarly experience, discussion with the church leaders and pastors all around here in our denomination to say, you know, what the pastors who are coming up through the MDiv and going out into ministry, what do they really need to know? What are we not doing well? What do we need to push them on? And for me, again, it wasn't until hindsight that I realized how important that was, because if it was up to me, I would have just taken Greek, Hebrew, biblical studies, maybe a little bit of theology, but that's it, right? But when I did an MDiv, like I had to take counseling, I had to take you know, pastoral leadership. And I realized, you know, for instance, in the counseling, uh, if because I was forced to take a course like that, I learned that I wasn't actually a very good listener, but I learned empathy and I learned compassion. And I realized I had my own stuff from my childhood I had to deal with too. So uh, the degree, uh, when you take something like an MDiv or whatever it might be, uh, there's people behind that process who said, the people going into ministry or going into this, uh, you know, this vocation, we really think they need to be exposed to this through these courses. And so we need to kind of honor that as well, because in the midst of it, sometimes you're just, you know, you're, you're biting, you know, biting down in your lip saying, why am I doing this <laughs> at times? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's really only in hindsight that I've, that I've been able to really appreciate those things that I went through that if I were left to myself, I would have never taken a course like that. Yeah, that's good. I know for us, it's on the second page of our degree completion plan, and I just never turned to that page. <laughs> I thought I could, fi- I can figure this roadmap out myself, and so I'll start at the end of the, the line. You know, that's why I took Romans so early. Uh, and so I think your words, Danny, are really wise. Yeah, I think it, it, it's also okay. You know, if, if for, for listeners, you know, who are thinking about. Hey, what would it be like, you know, to take, you know, a, a class? You know, I, I'm thinking about maybe going into the ministry, maybe doing this or that. Well, j- just just take one. You know, e- even if it's Great. just auditing, uh, yeah. you, you you get exposure yeah. to what this is like. Uh, again, it it's not as expensive. You don't have the the pressure of assignments. Why not? Yeah. You know, just just you know, get your feet wet, try it out. If if you're never going to go that direction, that's fine too. But you know, you. You're never going to, you know, when, when you do different things, you know, I, in my own experience here, the, the, the Lord will tell you, yeah, you know, you know, do this or that, or, or I want you to do, you know, go further here, or he'll, you know, he'll make it very you know, clear to you that, you know, what, what I really want to do in ministry, I, I, I may not need a, a degree for this. I'm, I may take two or three more, more courses. I may just learn how to be a good student. Those things will become evident. You don't have to have all the answers up front. And, and I think a lot of people feel some kind of pressure to know exactly, you know, what, what the will of God for them is up front. You, you don't need that. God knows what he's dealing with when he's working with people. Well, and you, you just I, don't have to have that. I think the church would benefit from a lot more men and women who said, I only want to take one class and I'm going to take a hermeneutics class, mm-hmm. um, you know, or I'm going to take a class on uh, how to teach the Bible. And it would just, it would give back to the local church in, in great ways. And so you don't have to say, oh, if I go to seminary, I'm really committing to quit my job mm-hmm. and to go take a pastorate. I don't think that's true. And I think in some cases, you know, some people who found, did that would eventually recognize, oh, I want to take a pastorate. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of people uh, would just find 20, 30 40 years of vibrant ministry as lay leaders within the church, as deacons or elders. Uh, I think that'd be great. Yeah. You know, and, and you might be in a situation, maybe your pastor didn't go to seminary. Well, why not devote some resources into letting him take a class? Absolutely. Or if, or if yeah. you're elders or deacons or whatever, or, or you teach, you know, in, in church or, you, you know, you run small groups, maybe your church will help you out. Just take, you know, a, a class. It, it It'll raise the bar a little bit. It helps you to, you know, interact with people a little bit better. You, you you're able to answer, you know, questions. You know, it's not like you know there's a, a silver bullet class. You're going to know the answers to everybody's questions. But you know, the the more you you sort of put in, you know, mm-hmm. the you know put into your mind, and then the, the better you know your thinking becomes. 
you're just going to naturally be able to help people a little bit more when they do have questions. And, yeah, you know, entering into the conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Education formulates you as a person so much that mm-hmm. – such that you you know you know if I don't know the answer I think I know how I could start uh, finding the answer and entering into the dialogue. That's so much of what uh, formal education is about. It's not giving you all the answers because there's just too much to know. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. It's good. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been good, and you know, I I, I want to uh, again thank you guys. Recommend your your book again. What you know we what we talked about really you know just sort of scratches the surface in some areas that. If you're thinking at all about taking coursework in any way, again, even just auditing a class, there's a lot in this book that you'll really benefit from, just good advice. Uh, Certainly, if you are taking the plunge as a student, just how to navigate the process of, you know, what a degree program is like. Again, just, it's just good advice, you know, on, on how to how to manage your time, how to manage, you know, your family relationships, you know, your local church, all that sort of thing. Again, you, you said this, you wished you would have had, you know, this kind of book, you know, going into it all, at least somebody to just, just give you a heads up, you know, mm-hmm. Hey, this is going to happen to you or, Hey, you'll run into this. And when you run into this, here's, here's just some, some things you should think about doing or not doing. Again, there's a lot of that kind of material in this book. It's not just all about good study habits and resources and, you know, how to, how to sort of tackle a topic. You're going to get that too, but it's, it's a sort of fully orbed, you know, well-rounded uh, discussion of what it, what it really means, you know, to, to be in this sort of environment, this sort of situation, you know, surviving and thriving in seminary, but also again, uh, even, even if that's not your plan, you're, you're going to pick up a lot of good things in the book. So thank you guys for, for thank writing you. it. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you, know, you so Lord much for willing, the endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, Lord willing, you know, people will will get this. And I know if they'll get it, they're going to get something good out of it. Um, on, on, on any given page, you're going to learn something useful. So thanks again. Well, thanks very much. I was going to say, too, um, we, I wanted to make sure I was allowed to say it, but the plan is to keep the conversation going that this book is starting. And that's going to happen uh, in the next few weeks uh, as we launch a website called thriveseminary.com. Mm-hmm. So it'll be more discussion and, and topics like this, both from us uh, as well as um, soliciting articles from seminary students as well to hear what they're going through and how they're mm-hmm. tackling these types of things. So, so That's the conversation idea. will continue. Yeah. So thriveseminary dot com. Hopefully, in the next few weeks, that will launch. Yeah, okay. and well, we we would love some of your audience, you know, who are seminary students or graduates, to uh, to email us, and we'd love to continue that with their help. Well, when that when that goes live, you know, let me know. I'll I'll blog about it, and we will we will amend uh, the episode page uh, for this episode. I mean, we'll we'll have a link to the book, obviously, on the episode page. But once that site is live, just let us know. We'll Thank make you. sure people know about it. Thanks Thank very you much. much. Have a good one, you guys. Bye. Take care. Yep. Bye bye. All right, Mike. Well, that's very interesting. It's always. Uh good to know where us lay people can go to get information to learn more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's important. I mean, there's a lot of good material out there that again, as we pointed out, you don't even have to pay anything for. There's a lot of good research, uh, research stuff out there and people ought to know about it. And next week back into Melchizedek part three. Yep. Yep. We're going to wrap up Melchizedek. One one more part. We're not going to break that into two. One more part. We'll be done with him. (laughs) <laughs> well, well, then we get the Q and A. So don't forget if you have it. I've gotten some questions, Mike. So uh, if you got any Melchizedek questions, go ahead and send them to me at tracestrickland at gmail dot com uh, for our Melchizedek Q and A. I can't uh, imagine that there'd be anything left. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what stone is left unturned. So I guess we'll find right. out. But all right, Mike. Well, we just want to thank Danny and Ben for coming on the show and also for our sponsor of the episode, Faith Life, with their Logos 7 basic package, which you can sign up and get for free right now by going to logos.com slash Naked Bible. And again, we thank them for that. Please go support us by supporting them and getting that free uh, software. I think you'll love it, obviously. And with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. 
To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.